This is I Hear Things for Friday, November 12th, 2021. Music was better in my day. Now get out of my yard. Yesterday, my colleague at Edison Research, Megan Lazovic, co-presented our third annual Spoken Word Audio Report, along with uh, Lamar Johnson from NPR. It's one of my favorite projects of the year because it documents at a macro level the state of everything spoken word. And I love all spoken word programming. So yeah, podcasts, they're a big part of this, big part of the newsletter. They continue to grow. But so do audiobooks and news talk and sports radio and all of these things. They're all a vibrant part of the audio ecosystem. Some of the spoken word audio report, and let's call it SWAR. By the way, that makes me think of GWAR, but I'm broken. Much of SWAR is derived from Edison's ongoing share of ear service, which is the only single source measure of all things audio in America. By measuring everything from satellite and broadcast radio to streaming and podcasting with the same methodology, we can look at some fascinating trends that they're not just tech-related, they're societal. The headline of this year's study is that the share of ear for spoken word audio in America has grown 40% in seven years and 8% in the last year alone. That's pretty jaw-dropping as far as I'm concerned. And let me break that down just a little bit. Back in 2014, when we started Share of Ear, if you look at all of the audio that we listened to as a function of time, 20% of what we listened to was spoken word audio in some form. 80% of what we listened to was music. We generally listen mostly to music. Today, in 2021, seven years later, 28% of what we listen to is spoken word, and 72% is music. Now, if you're a podcaster, you can't help but focus on the spoken word side of that graph, which shows, again, the percentage of time that we spend on spoken word audio versus music. You should also know that the total amount of time that we spend listening to audio every day is about four hours, and it's been that throughout those seven years. So when we say that spoken word audio has grown 40% from 2014 to 2021, that growth is literally at the expense of music, not by growing the top line of all audio. And while there are multiple components to that share, podcasting has been the primary driver. Now, at this point, I don't question the growth of podcasting and spoken word audio. They're growing. That, That trend is clear. But what the heck is going on with the music side of that graph? The flip side of this zero-sum game is that we are listening to less music than we used to, and that even includes our own music, like vinyl and CDs and digital files, all of that stuff. Now, I think we take for granted that podcasting is taking more and more of our earball time, but we should also consider that music might be giving up share actively in some way. Now, the overarching trend in our share of ear data, those trends are actually pretty clear. We are listening to more music on pure play streaming services like Spotify and Pandora and more music on YouTube. They're still growing. And we're listening to less music on commercial broadcast radio stations. And we're listening to our own collections of music a lot less, actually. But these forces have not offset each other. They haven't broken even. Music is trending down. And here's something truly surprising. When you look at these trends by age, this trend is magnified on the youngest end of the demographic. In fact, the growth in spoken word audio in seven years, 55 plus, has been from 26% of all audio content to 28%, a modest bump. 35 to 54, it's grown from 22% of audio time to 30%, a significant bump. But 13 to 34 has grown from 12% to 26%, more than doubled in seven years. And yes, that is at the expense of music. The youngest demographic in this country is listening to a lot more spoken word than they used to. And I think you can complete this sentence all by yourself. Music and music discovery are more important to us as teens and young adults than at any other point in our lives. And today's young people are turning more and more towards spoken word. 
The New York Times published a detailed analysis of uh, some Spotify data a few years back. I'll link to it in the show notes. And it showed that people continue to listen later in life to the music that was popular when they were in high school. And by the way, that's something that radio programmers have known for over 40 years. Uh, My former boss, Frank Cody, I think, had a whole chart of this in his office uh, in the 80s. So what happens, though, when music listening is so influenced by our high school years, what happens to music listening later in life when the formative years of today's young people aren't quite as musical as mine were? I think that's an interesting question. Beyond my ken, it's a, a, a PhD dissertation maybe. But, you know, music is just, well, it's just weird right now. I don't think people fully appreciate how important radio really is and really was to the formation of your music taste and the longevity of that. When a great new album hit radio in the 70s or the 80s, the hits from that album, they were metered out. Record companies would work one single at a time, and radio would play that single until it started to fade, and then they'd bring out the next single, if there was one. Having two songs at the same time uh, in the top 40, that was fairly uncommon, and it would it was generally a testament to the power of that first single. It was just hanging on for so long. Most weeks, if you listen to Casey Kasem or Shadow Stevens, uh, any of them do their weekly top 40 shows on the radio, you are going to hear 40 different artists from 40 different albums. And more importantly, thanks to radio, there was a simultaneous shared experience around listening to those 40 songs. By the way, that's why we still buy Beatles records. Now that, and they're, they're objectively great, of course. Now today, when Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran releases an album to the streaming services, there's no program director to put a break on your listening. And that leads to phenomena like Ed Sheeran having all 16 tracks from his Divide album be in the top 25 at the same time in multiple countries. Or the artist Future replacing himself with the number one album on the Billboard charts, replacing himself. Or what's happening right now with Adele, who is currently destroying the supply chain for non-Adele vinyl. It all burns faster, it burns quicker. And the artists that are below the top 40, they're not just competing with the new Ed Sheeran single. They're competing with every song on the album in what data shows us is a shrinking window of available time devoted to music. Uh, And here's something really interesting to me. The other unseen cost of all of this was something I didn't think about until I heard Garth Brooks talk about it at a big country radio and music conference that I attend called CRS. A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to give the research keynote at CRS, and I was immediately followed on stage by a conversation with Garth Brooks. So I legit get to say I shared the stage with Garth. One of the most fascinating things that he talked about was the unseen impact of the change in the music economy from album-based to singles-based. And that began as a product of the iTunes Music Store, enabling us to buy only the song or songs that we want from an album instead of having to buy the whole album. Now, Nashville, more than any other music community, is driven by songwriters. And when a full album sold, Some songwriter who got a writing credit for a deep cut, a song that wasn't a single, but a good song, some songwriter who got a writing credit for a cut on that album, they got paid. Maybe a little, but they got paid. You get a deep cut on a Reba album, and then maybe you make enough money to stay in the game and keep writing songs until hopefully, eventually, you get that big single for George Strait or Lady A. But with digital music replacing album sales for singles, that yet-to-be-rewarded songwriter doesn't get that Reba album track. And maybe they go back to waiting tables. The decimation of the album economy has given consumers choice, right? We, we can now buy that single can of Coke instead of, of having to buy a case of RC Cola to get that Coke. And that's how a lot of albums are, I suppose. But it had unintended effects. Effects on songwriters and lots of other people that make up the cogs of the great music machine. Now, these aren't original thoughts. I'm not the first to wonder aloud about any of this. Music is a personal thing, 
And if someone only wants to listen to Ed Sheeran all the time, then hey, follow your bliss. But people in podcasting talk so much about the difficulties with podcast discovery. Hey, look, at least podcasting share is growing. Try being a new artist right now that is not named Taylor or Ed, and try building a career. Now, some of you might be saying to yourselves that, hey, maybe Tom is just a cranky old man who thinks music was better in his day than it is now. To that, I have two replies. First, music was better in my day, so get off my lawn. But more importantly, whether it is or isn't, what has changed objectively is our shared experience of music. And shared experiences create memories and meaning and the stickiness of music over the course of our lives. Now, let's not fall down the slippery slope here. Music isn't going anywhere. Music is primal. It's part of our souls. But in the current business model, it's priced in a way that artists aren't making a lot from streaming and the streaming providers have an incentive to pay them even less. A few years ago, I wrote a piece about why Spotify was so keen to get into the podcasting space. I'll link to that. The overt reason was that Spotify wants to be the number one audio platform in the world, and you cannot be the number one audio platform in the world without spoken word audio. But I also pointed out this, and I I quote the Tom of two years ago. In its current form, Spotify's best customers are not necessarily the ones who use the platform the most. Every song that is played for every listener, Spotify has to cut royalty checks to pay the performer, the composer, and other rights holders. The longer a premium listener stays on the platform, the more of those checks get cut, and the more music per dollar value the Spotify premium listener gets from the platform. Now, if you're Spotify, the answer is not, please listen less to Spotify so we don't have to write so many checks. Instead, it's to introduce content that they actually own, like, say, podcasts. If the Spotify listener converts from 100% music to even 90% music and 10% podcasts, that's a 10% decrease in those checks that Spotify has to cut to other people. Back to 2021, Tom. If the amount of time we spend listening to music has decreased from 80% to 72%, that's not just a 10% decrease in time. It's a 10% decrease in royalties. With more time spent listening to spoken word, that's bound to have an impact on the cost of goods sold by the streaming providers. And that in turn shrinks the available dollars to artists. And maybe, just maybe, that discourages the next Chris Stapleton or the next Casey Musgraves or even the next Guar. Now look, I don't think we will ever go back to the days when artists made enough from records to buy Lear jets to shuttle dates around like the Eagles did. But I do think it's time for podcasts and the music industry to figure that crap out. The various royalties for composition, performance, and mechanical reproduction have largely left music on the sidelines of the podcast revolution. It's just too complicated, and it's just too expensive. I was listening to a great conversation in the podcasting seriously uh, weekly clubhouse session with Juleka Lantiga. It was a fantastic session with creator of the podcast, Who Was Prince? And the saddest thing about that whole conversation and the making of that remarkable podcast was that they didn't even consider using actual Prince music from the show. Didn't even consider it because they knew that some lawyer from Skadden Arp, Slate, Meager, and Flom, or some other firm would have shot them in the face. Now, I hope that gets figured out for the sake of musicians, if nothing else. And you know, maybe NFT technology holds some hope here. I will not pretend to be an expert on NFTs, but I do know that they hold the promise of a completely alternative way for artists to get value for their work in a decentralized system. And yes, Taken to its extreme, this means someday some wealth manager in Long Island will eventually pay the Rolling Stones $100 million to own the digital music file for Sympathy for the Devil so they can blast it out of their windows of their Yukon and scream, I own this bleep. Yeah, but let's think smaller. 
Let's think a lot smaller. Today, podcasters, they can't use any part of a song. It doesn't matter if it's 30 seconds or eight seconds without legal and financial exposure. You can't. Fair use, in quotes, is a very, very limited concept, and it isn't about fairness. So don't claim that. But I would be willing to pay for a small snippet of a song as an NFT that I could use as my opening music, for example. And I don't know what song I might use as the opening music to I Hear Things, this podcast. But I would certainly consider paying the artist directly for an NFT that lets me use the 10-second hook of a song in my show. Bill Simmons is certainly paying Pearl Jam uh, to use a few seconds of one of their songs in the Bill Simmons podcast. That's a private deal that he has worked out. Let's make that available to more podcasters. Uh, And NFTs may be the key to that. Now, again, I am no expert on NFTs, other than to see how lousy some of my friends' taste in art seems to be. But there may be no better time than right now for musicians to get creative about the podcasting space with the share of ear tilting away from them. Nothing sells music like people talking about music. And that is what we learned from Casey Kasem and Shadow Stevens. And actually, I do know what I would use as my podcast theme song. It would be Guar. Well, it's announcement time. I have been collaborating with my very brilliant wife, Tamson Webster. She's at TamsonWebster.com on a special thing for podcasters. I get a lot of bad pitches for podcasts. I mean, most of them are. And to be fair, most of them don't come from the podcasters themselves. Now, if I were a PR professional, I would create some content around how to write the perfect pitch for your podcast. But A, I'm not. And B, that's not the problem. The problem I see so often is that people can't pitch their podcast, not because they can't write a good pitch. It's because they have a podcast that can't be pitched very well. So it's a more sinister issue. So I'm teaming up with Tamsin, who, besides being my wife, is the author of Find Your Red Thread. I'll put some links in the show notes. And a very smart human. And we've put together a special webinar designed to help you make sure that you have a podcast that can be pitched successfully. And I can promise you a few things. One, you will absolutely think about your show in a different way. Two, you will have at least one moment of pure frustration. And three, you will push through it, you will do the work, and you will never look back. Do not make me wrong on that. Uh, I will have all of the registration material and a clever name for this very, very soon. We have those things, by the way. But here's my ask for this week. I am only going to talk about this to email subscribers. The webinar will be free, but the links to register and access and other information will only be included in the email version of this newsletter. So uh, if you're listening to this podcast or if you're reading the newsletter on the web, go to the website, tomwebster.media, and hit the subscribe button. I don't sell your email. I don't charge to subscribe. And you only hear from me once a week at most. It's a better deal than Dogecoin. Believe me. So do it. I'm Tom Webster. This has been I Hear Things for Friday, November 12th. I'll see you in a couple weeks. 